This is a presentation that I gave uh, this morning to the Society for Brain Mapping and Therapeutics to a subcommittee on artificial intelligence and augmented intelligence, and, uh, and also uh, the, uh, the brain. And so uh, and my emphasis in this talk is on what's called computational neuroanatomy, as well as the networks of the brain. Uh, and so you can understand how the brain does its intelligence and how it augments reality. Uh, so what is computational neuroanatomy and how does it relate to artificial intelligence and augmented reality? Well, the answer is the brain neuroanatomy is the structural matrix whereby electricity and magnetism do the computations. And it's the shape and, and mapping of the brain that does the computations, not like a computer does, where you have uh, binary numbers, zeros and ones and registers uh, and memory locations, and then you do multiplication, you know, addition, etc., cetera, uh, and comparisons uh, with binary numbers. Instead, the in the shape of a computer is irrelevant, but the shape of the brain is absolutely fundamental because that's how it does its computations. Uh, this whole field was developed by Eric Swartz when he was at New York Medical College in the 70s. Uh, he's, a, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, and he uh, came to one of uh, my, my presentations in Valhalla, uh, New York, along where Dr. E. Roy John and myself uh, and we're both on the faculty at New York Medical College and we we're teaching uh, medical students uh, things about the brain. And uh, he met with us afterwards and said he wanted to, he would love to be a postdoctoral fellow. And uh, Roy, uh, John, and myself, we decided for me to uh, teach him uh, uh, about the brain and, uh, and, and give him, a, we had money for a postdoctoral fellowship. And uh, this time we were doing research in cats where we had implanted electrodes in their brains where they're doing various kinds of tasks. And so Eric helped out with that and learned about the brain. But after about a month, a year and a half or so, he came into my office and he, he said, um, you know, listen, here's this uh, data from Talbert and Marshall showing uh, the magnification factor of, of how the density of, um, of cells are in the retina, particularly near the fovea, at two, and it's mapping to the cerebral cortex. And he could see that it was a what's called a conformal map. Uh, conformal maps were developed in uh, the late 1800s by Bernard Riemann. And essentially, if you go to the Science Museum, like in New York, and uh, it, it, what it is, you take it the, a sphere, which is the Earth, and you map it to a rectangle. And that way, navigation on, on ships around the world, etc., they can easily see the entire world just by looking at a rectangle rather than having to spin a sphere. But it has many more important things uh, than uh, just, uh, just that mapping for navigation purposes. And as Roger Penrose says in his book, The Road to Reality, Roger Penrose was awarded the Nobel Prize in mathematics. He says there is also a mystery about how it is that we perceive mathematical truth. It is not just that our brains are programmed to calculate in reliable ways. There is something much more profound than in the insights that even the humblest among us possess. And I wrote in my handbook of quantitative EEG and EEG biofeedback, according to computational neuroanatomy, the sensory motor, a sensory cortex mappings and the remappings as fluid flows during embryogenesis result in the physical shape of the brain that itself has computational properties such as size, rotational invariances, and topological matching, and that therefore mathematics and anatomy and consciousness are fundamentally linked. It's also, it's an, uh, there are ideal mathematical forms, which is primarily a logarithmic spiral uh, in which biological processes can quickly do match and mismatch of expectations and predictions and error correction to reduce uncertainty by both at the quantum and classical uh, physics levels and to approximate ideal forms at each moment of time. All of that is going on inside the brain. And this is what Eric Swartz started with. At the upper part is the Talbert-Marshall magnification factor. 
and uh, in which there's more connections in the fovea uh, than uh, to the cortex and the, and in the retina than there is the periphery of our retinas. And uh, A is a mapping that Talbert and Marshall did first of the retina, which is a disc, onto the visual cortex, which is a rectangle. And the mapping of a disc to a rectangle is a conformal map, as uh, Riemann uh, discovered. And it's logarithmic. The, if you look at the top of magnification, that's a logarithm function, an exponential function. And, and that's foundational uh, in the history of uh, physics and, and, uh, and, and uh, our economy, in which in, in the 1400s, 1400s, 1500s, logarithms were developed to allow people to do multiplication by addition. That is, that's one of the beautiful things about logarithms. Uh, and so there's tables of logarithms that can do quite complicated uh, multiplication just by simply uh, adding. And so nature has found a way to do cross correlations and covariance uh, comparisons, match, mismatch by addition. And that's part of what the, we mean by computational neuroanatomy. So there's the visual cortex and A, uh, da Daniel Witteridge, uh, a few years later, replicated it, and, and that's you can see the the degrees on the disc of the retina mapped as straight lines uh, on the the rectangular shape of the cortex, and W equals log Z is the conformal map equation that Eric used, and uh, C and B, I guess B C has the visual uh, hemifield uh, in the Z plane that's mapping to the W plane, which is the rectangular uh, hemisphere. Now, this is a logarithmic conformal map. And uh, this is uh, studies by Allman and Cass and uh, monkeys, where they've uh, presented flashes of light uh, to the, the, the monkeys. And then they measured the responses of neurons in the visual cortex, visual v, V1 and, the, and, the, and V2. Uh, and found that these, the, there's a spiral in, in the retina mapped to straight lines in the visual cortex. So that's the logarithmic spiral. That's the essence of uh, the conformal map. Now, what do we gain by this? I mean, this is an unusual thing. Now, it turns out if you, the, uh, the cochlea is also a logarithmic spiral. That's for sound. And the mapping of our skin uh, on the uh, to the somatosensor cortex is conformal. That is, a straight line in the somatosensor cortex is a spiral going around our limbs and our body shapes. Uh, and uh, it's like, as they described it, as the laces of a Roman soldier's boot. So uh, the with, with some of these things that you gain is uh, size invariance. Uh, on the left is the visual hemifield. is a not a really good slide. I took it from one of Eric's uh, publications. And what as you increase the size of a square on your retina, you keep the exact same shape in the in the cortex. It's shifted, but it's the same shape. Same thing with rotational invariance. And so some of the computational advantages of logarithmic mapping uh, is summarized that by uh, the advantages are one, size invariance, rotational invariance, information compression, depth perception, form perception, visual illusions, and intersensory comparisons as a few of them, not to mention some things that happen with our, our skin and our uh, auditory systems. And so uh, it, it's a remarkable property of uh, the general theory of relativity, actually, to solve an assortment of visual perceptual problems. But our brains do this by their shape, by their mappings. They don't do it by registers and, and zeros and ones like computers do. And you'd have to have a computer the size of Rhode Island in order to do some of the computations that a, a two and a half, three pound uh, mass of tissue floating inside our skulls do all the time. And so uh, in 1909, uh, Corbinian Broadman uh, examined uh, the cadaver tissue of uh, people and under a microscope and looked at the, the cortex. And he could see that there were 
different cytoarchitecture in different parts of the cortex. By that means different size cells, different way that they're oriented, different way that they're connected. That's cytoarchitecture. And he reasoned that if there's different clusters of cells who have different connections and cytoarchitecture, they must therefore have different functions. In 1909, there was no, the neurology did not exist. Psychiatry didn't really exist either. It was it coming out of the Darwinian era where structure and function are related. And he did an excellent job, spent a lot of time going through the, um, uh, the, the set of architecture of neurons. And you can see that uh, here is uh, just images of different types. And this comes right from Broadman's book, different types of cells in different parts of the cortex. And in fact, there are different functions for these different parts of the cortex. And there are 44 Brahman areas on the left, 44 on the right. Uh, I worked at the National Institutes of Health in the, in, in the 1990s, in the beginning of the human brain mapping program. And uh, we discovered as we in PET scans primarily, but also EEG and magnetic encephalography and spec scans, that when people did visual tasks, then Brahman areas 17, 18, and 19 would light up. When they would move their hands or fingers, uh, then uh, Brahman areas one, two, and three would light up or five. Uh, sound was uh, the temporal lobes. And so uh, Brahman uh, regions were resurrected from 1909 and confirmed by PET scans over and over again. And so today, the Brahman areas are a fundamental part of the human brain mapping program, fundamental part of neuroscience, because there are different functions for these different parts of the cortex. And we can measure them now with great precision with EEG, and I'll show in a minute. But these parts are mapping and remapping. Uh, the, the visual cortex is mapping to the inferior temporal uh, region. Uh, and, and, and there's loops within loops as they iterate and map. Uh, and that's how the brain does its computations. Now, very briefly, what we do with EEG is we try to identify uh, deep sources in the brain, including the cerebellum, different parts where these clusters of neurons get active. They generate currents and we can measure the the sources of them by measuring the EEG at the scalp surface. And, and this is a standard method. It's been used since the 1970s, but um, and it's evolved and now even more precise. And the way it's done is, uh, is we, we, people use initially what they call the lead field. They still use the lead field, but in those early days, it was a sphere that you can see in the upper left here. This is the lead field. It, it looks, it calculates the different conductivities of skin, skull, and brain and electricity is being generated, say, at this point, it will have different potentials at the surface depending upon its uh, location. And these angles are very, very important because you can, from here, from the surface, you can identify where the sources are. So the lead field is very important. The problem is that the brain is not spherical. It's shaped like a loaf of bread. It's uh, flat on the bottom and it's elongated. So there's a mismatch, particularly near the temporal lobes, where the brain is flat and it mismatches the ideal sphere. And I'll go into what that means in a minute. And there's different ways to do this. You can look at a single dipole, move it around. If there's an epilepsy, let's say you move this uh, dipole around. Now it's, it's got X, Y, and Z. All dipoles have a three-dimensional in, in vector calculus. Those of you that have taken that uh, course and in secondary algebra, you'll get this. You move uh, this dipole around until you minimize the variance in the location where the epileptic focus is. That was done a lot in National Institutes of Health. But there's a, an, another way, to, it's called distributed source analysis or multiple dipole. This was developed also for cardiology. In this case, it happens to be a, a picture of the, of the heart. That's where you have a fixed number of, you have a fixed location uh, and a, a set of dipoles, you can have thousands of them. Uh, we use 12,400 uh, voxels, dipoles today. Uh, and then you, you uh, solve the, this inverse solution over here. Uh, and it, you weight those dipoles that have the greatest contribution to the, ele the electricity at the scalp surface. And the way you do that is you move the lead field here, K, underneath E. So now the current sources, J, are equal to E, 
which is the electrical potential, two-dimensional electrical potential on the scalp surface, divided by the three-dimensional lead field. You also ha have to add constraints to it, because if you don't, then there's an infinite number of solutions. That was what von Helmholtz discovered when he, he developed this equation in the 1800s. And so cardiologists and uh, neuroscientists, you constrain the equation so you get one single solution. And I'm not going to go into the details of that, but this is the basic way you do it. And there's standardized Loretta. Uh, what that was developed was to deal with this problem of having a spherical uh, head model or lead field and the brain that's shaped like a loaf of bread. And Roberto Pasquale Marquis uh, created the standardization method essentially by taking the standard de deviation of the currents in all the voxels and uh, then dividing that standard deviation into the voxels. So he standardized it and it minimized the error where the, uh, the there's a mismatch between the lead field and the shape of the brain. But even with that, uh, you see this is a, a study in 2008, uh, I believe, of um, comparing different inverse solutions. And you compare the S Loretta to the non-standardized Loretta at when the signal to noise ratio is very high, you actually in simulations have zero localization error. Now there's, you know, there's EEG does not have this situation. We have 20, uh, uh, the ratio of signal to noise is 25. Uh, but uh, the, so most of the inverse solutions have two, one centimeter to two centimeter um, localization accuracy. And it's hard to get below one centimeter uh, because of the skull. Uh, and the, uh, but the Brahmin areas are all larger than two centimeters. And what we do today is we just look at the center voxel for each of the Brahmin areas, which is representative of the entire cytoarchitectural unique area that Brahmin discovered. Uh, and today we use this method, it's called uh, the weighted S Loretta. Uh, and or SW Loretta. And what we do with this, uh, this is done by Ernesto Soler. And at NIH, we didn't, we compared what's called the boundary element method versus the spherical head model. The boundary element method, which is used here in SW Loretta, is where you, you look at the actual boundary of the brain, not, not a sphere, an abstract sphere, but the actual shape of the brain. And you just get a mouse and you go around the outer parts of the brain because you, you can see the MRI's got uh, the brain in it. And that becomes the boundary element. That's the rather than a spherical head model. So it's a realistic uh, uh, volume uh, constraint. That improves the accuracy tremendously. So, but nonetheless, inside the skull, there is, or where the brain is, there's a lot of heterogeneity of the tissue. You have white matter, gray matter, cerebral spinal fluid, blood vessels, all kinds of stuff, and different conductivities that, inf that affect the electricity when you're measured from the scalp surface. And whereas magnetism does not have that problem. Uh, the heterogeneity of the skull, of, in the interior of the skull, is invisible to magnetism. And uh, uh, Ernesto, having a bachelor's degree in quantum mechanics and then uh, a PhD in, uh, in, in biomedical engineering, um, developed this equation essentially where you take the heterogeneous uh, lead field and you uh, multiply it by uh, single value decomposition. Now that's Roger Penrose's equations. That's one of his many equations. And what that does is it weights the heterogeneous lead field so it becomes homogeneous here on the right. It becomes homogeneous just like with magnetism. Now electricity and magnetism have, can, they're not, electricity is no longer distorted by the heterogeneity of the volume space inside the skull. But the advantage of electricity over magnetism is magnetism is about 1,800 times weaker than electricity. Uh, and uh, at NIH, we would we would do experiments with magnetism, uh, but we had to be in a big shielded room. And when the subway would go by, it was about two, a mile, two miles away, uh, it would create huge artifact. So we had a schedule of the subway schedule on the wall. And so we did not run experiments uh, when the subway was going by. Uh, or we would try to minimize that and do it in between the movement of the, of the trains. And, but that's not a problem with EEG. EEG, you can get an amplifier for you know, $2,000, $3,000. Uh, MEG is a million. 
2 million. Now they're trying to get it down to maybe a half a million, uh, but it's not portable. You have to get uh, most of the time liquid helium. That's $20,000 a month. And, uh, and it's, you have this big, huge shielded room uh, compared to putting on a cap and walking around and measuring the EEG, you can actually transmit it uh, you know, wirelessly uh, to another room. And so it's uh, inexpensive, it's portable, and it's accurate. This is an example of the inverse solution comparisons between different number of channels. And the left column, uh, those are sources that are put into the left and right thalamus. The right column has the left and right thalamic sources, but in addition, a right occipital source. And then we're comparing 19 channel source localization to 128 channel source localization. When I was at the National Institutes of Health, I was the project manager for the first 128 channel EEG system. And we compared 19 channels to 32 channels to 64 to 128 to 256. Above 32, there's not hardly any improvement. And there's not a lot of difference between 19 and 32. And as you can see here, there's not a lot of difference in source localization accuracy between 19 and 128. A 19-channel amplifier is two or three thousand dollars. A 128-channel amplifier is over a hundred thousand dollars. And it's a, a, a real. It's, it takes a long time to get those electrodes on. Compared to 19, we can just put on a cap. That people have improved it a bit, but it's expensive. Uh, and you don't gain that much in source localization. Magnetic encephalography is shown at the bottom with 148 channels. Uh, and there is a, a slight improvement in the localization accuracy. Uh, but again, that's a million, two million, and uh, 20,000 a month in liquid helium, and it's not portable. So that shows you that 19 channel EEG is quite feasible to use to get good source localization, and it's not expensive. Uh, this is a, a study that. Uh, Ernesto Soler did, uh, and Dr. Soler, uh, comparing S. Loretta to S. W. Loretta, and S. W. Loretta has a considerably better uh, uh, signal noise ratio, more accuracy. Uh, this is a paper that we published on intelligence and EEG and information flow, uh, looking at uh, uh, homeostatic neuroplasticity and efficiency in the brain, and there, we use a method called a phase slope index. Uh, which is called functional conductivity that measures the magnitude and direction of information flow. It's a standard method. It's well published. Uh, and, and this is something we I took from the paper. Uh, say by analogy, this is the way you can understand conductivity. Imagine a sports stadium and a uh, parking lot and a street connecting the sports stadium to the parking lot. That is uh, structural conductivity. That's there is uh, uh, computational processes that happen in a living brain, but the, your brain is the same whether you're alive or dead. So if you look at the structure of the brain shortly after death, it looks the same as when you were alive. So uh, it's just the, the it's, it's the foundational structure where these these mappings are happening to allow the electricity to flow uh, between, uh, in this case, the parking lot to the stadium and stadium to the parking lot. Now, functional connectivity is a correlation between changes in these two locations. So for example, uh, cars come into the parking lot and then uh, the stadium fills up with people. Then when the game is over, people leave the stadium and now cars depart from the parking lot. That's correlation between activity in these two locations, the parking lot and the sports stadium. Whereas uh, effective connectivity measures the direction and magnitude of the flow of people that travel between the two locations. So you, you can see how many people are going from the parking lot to the stadium, how many people are going from the stadium to the parking lot. That's effective connectivity. And what we found is that uh, we could discriminate high IQ from, uh, these were 120 IQ versus 90 IQ, 80 IQ subjects that we have a large uh, database. I think there's about 100, 200 subjects in this study. And um, we could discriminate uh, high and low IQ at 98% classification accuracy. And they cross-validate it with intermediate IQ people. And uh, so you got low, middle, and high. And if you look at the phase slope index, which is the, the the information flow over long distances, 
you see that the lower IQ subjects have more information flow over long distances than the high IQ subjects. And that's because long distance communication is less efficient than local processing. And this is how we modeled it. It's called a small world model. Uh, again, these are well-established models in, in, in science, neuroscience and other sciences. So for example, if you have to transport goods from Australia or China to the US, it's expensive and it takes a long time. A more efficient way to do things is, still don't, is to have local information processing, like hub one segregation is well segregated, well differentiated. Most of the information flow is in that hub or in hub two, and you minimize the long distance expense of going from one location for long distance. And uh, this, there is short and long distance uh, communication is going on all the time in the brain, but it's a matter of balance between local information processing and minimizing the long distance uh, communication. Whereas the lower IQ subjects rely a lot on the less efficient long distance information flow compared to the higher IQ subjects. And so that's just basically, uh, you can measure this using EEG. And we also do this uh, in sight. We use inverse solutions and look at the phase slope index between hubs in the brain, between the broadband areas. Now, computational neuroanatomy and cerebellar EEG sources, and, and you can measure the cerebellum. The cerebellum is one tenth the size of the cerebral cortex, but has about the same number of neurons. And it's an amazing part of the brain. It's a bit of a mystery because it's folded in the back of our necks. Uh, but there's 2,036 uh, citations in the National Library of Medicine. If you go to the PubMed National Library of Medicine database, type in EEG and cerebellum, then you'll get 2,036. I did this uh, a, a month ago, so there's probably more publications now. And this is the structure of the cerebellum. I'm not going to go into that, but there, there's these mappings of different uh, relay stations, etc. They're all doing computations. Uh, here's an example of that. If on the left, you can see the various parts of the cerebellum laid out and the mapping of the body surface and the uh, anterior part of the cerebellum is that figure uh, with the head down and the feet expanded and the, and the hands are large because there's a lot of sen sensory communication going on the hands compared to the forearm uh, or the neck or your stomach. Your feet are really larger and they're mapping because you do a lot more stuff and then your face, of course. But notice that the the posterior part of the cerebellum, that, uh, that mapping is flipped and rotated. It's flipped, uh, you know, 180 degrees and then rotated 90 degrees left and right. So you have multiple copies of the body surface and a lot of computation that's done uh, in the brain for computational neuroanatomy is by replicating, by rotating using uh, conformal maps, uh, rotating and then doing matching and mismatching and flipping and matching and mismatching. So you have replication. The DNA molecules, an example, we have two uh, strands and, and the combination of the two uh, minimize, maximizes the information, minimizes the error. Same thing happens with conformal mapping. Uh, here's a study by Anderson et al. where they uh, can measure EEG, I mean, uh, cerebellar sources using a magnetic encephalography and EEG, EEG from the scalp surface. This is another study showing the source localization in the cerebellum uh, in this particular study. This is another source localization using SW Loretta in this case in the cerebellum. This is actually motor imagery where the subjects would imagine moving and you would see the cerebellum light up when they imagine moving. Uh, this is a study by Samuelson et al. And what they found is that uh, you, they, indeed you can measure cerebellar deep sources uh, from the scalp surface, but it's roughly 30 to 60 percent weaker than the cortical signal. The localization accuracy is pretty similar, but it's it's a weaker signal. So you've got to have good quality recording conditions. This is an example of the difference in the uh, the the, uh, the EEG amplitude as a function of distance from the deep cerebellar sources. So you go down to thirty millimeters, and you'll see it's it, it's weaker for both MEG and EEG. Uh, and they compared. A magnetic encephalography in the cortex and the cerebellum 
uh, for uh, MEG, as well as EEG on the right. And uh, you can see where the cortical sources are, and you'll see that's a weaker source from the cerebellum, but nonetheless, you can measure the sources. This is an example uh, from their paper uh, looking at uh, magnetic encephalography and looking at the sources. The signal strength is in this graph, this bar graph down below, uh, showing that uh, the, you know, like uh, this CRUS1 and, and Vermis uh, uh, V1 uh, are red because they, they have a stronger signal. Uh, blue is a weaker signal, but you can still measure it, even though it's weaker. And so these colors here determine are showing you where the strong sources are on the cortex generated by the cerebellum. And now this is EEG. EEG actually has stronger sources um, than MEG. Uh, and uh, But they, you can measure the same regions as magnetic encephalography does than, than using EEG source localization, uh, and which means you, you don't need a million dollar um, or 20, you know, big magnet uh, or whatever you do with MEG. These are very weak. You have to be in a big uh, shielded room, uh, and, uh, and it's a lot more expensive compared to 19 channel EEG. So their conclusions is that, yeah, there's no trouble getting good resolution of the sources using EEG. And this is a common finding. Uh, now, this is an interesting study. This is with animals and then looking at uh, Parkinson's disorder. In the upper left, this is a diagram of a healthy uh, substantia nigra and, short, and uh, subthalamic nucleus and the thalamus and the uh, striatum, basal ganglia, and the projections to the cortex. This is a Parkinson uh, individual where the dopamine, which is manufactured in the substantia nigra, is absent. It's not there anymore. So this whole circuit becomes uh, oscillatory. And so people are shaking. Uh, that's the, the Parkinsonism symptoms because of the loss of dopamine. That's a neurotransmitter, neuromodulator, I mean. The cerebellum does not have any dopamine. And so what they did is they did biofeedback on the cerebellum to make it compensatory for the loss of the, the uh, substantia nigra uh, neurons. And so they did biofeedback using what's called uh, sensory motor uh, rhythm. Uh, that is a, it's a loop between the thalamus and the subthalamus and the sensory motor cortex and the cerebellum. So that dynamic loop between the, the source of the EEG being generated at the top of your head near your motor cortex and the uh, rhythmic dynamic coordination from the cerebellum to the red nucleus to the thalamus to the cortex. Uh, and then what they did is they removed the red nucleus in these monkeys and compared the cellular structure of the placebo control versus the experimental SMR subjects. And they found that there are more, there's more connections between the neurons because of the biofeedback. So they reward the, the, the proper movement to minimize. They made these animals Parkinsonian by eliminating their substantia nigra, their dopamine. So they had equal severity of symptoms, but they use cerebellar uh, biofeedback, sensory motor biofeedback, which the cerebellum is involved with, to uh, reduce the severity of the symptoms and actually grow more connections. And this is what we do with the our EEGs, uh, that we can look at the, the currents or the, or the voltages at the scalp surface. We look at these various hubs and nodes of the somatosensory cortex and, and also in the cerebellum. That's uh, just another view of that. We, we use the um, diffusion tensor imaging from the uh, Montreal Neurological Institute. It's a template and the National Institutes of Health. And we uh, uh, co-register the, the location of the hubs in the cerebellum and the somatosensory cortex, as well as all, there's 120 hubs that we look at uh, in all of the Brobman areas, as well as the deep structures. And then we did a, a, a test to see if we could uh, cross-validate the studies that are already published in the scientific literature. We just, we just wanted to see if we could do it as well. So we used the Romberg test. We have a finger to the nose and a heel to shin. And this is, comes from the Montreal Neurological Institute where the boundary of the cerebellum is seen 
and we just go from the deep parts of the brain to the top so you can see where the the boundary element uh, constraints are on the uh, inverse solution. This is the finger-to-nose test. In this case, you can see the right finger-to-nose. Uh, we also then do left finger-to-nose. Uh, and so we're recording the EEG. You can see the EEG streaming across the screen up there. Um, and this is the heel to shin. In this case, it's left heel to right shin. And then we do right shin to, I mean, right heel to left shin. And again, we're recording EEG at the same time. And then we do the inverse solution. You find that the left finger to nose has a left source in the cerebellum. And right finger to nose has a right source in the cerebellum. Now, this is cross-validation. This is where you do science. You form hypotheses, and then you test the hypotheses. We can repeat this over and over again. We get the same results. That's how you do science. You don't have, you don't have to have speculation and hope and things like this. You just test it. Form an hypothesis, uh, and usually form the null hypothesis, is that there'll be no difference between left and right. In fact, you won't find any sources. And that's, we can reject the null hypothesis because we can repeat this over and over and get, and get the same results. And this is where we did t-tests between uh, these various measures of functional and effective connectivity. Uh, the percentage of, of significant t-tests are on the, the uh, y-axis, and that's in comparison to the uh, resting state control. That is, you first have people sit and just close their eyes for five minutes. And so you got a, a baseline of what the brain is like without any movement. And then you move you know, left to right and right to left to do the, the various uh, uh, number tests. And you find highly significant differences between the baseline. And then we also looked at discriminant analyses of mild traumatic brain injury as well as severe uh, traumatic brain injury. The mild uh, are, uh, the normals are solid blue, the, the mild are uh, dashed blue. The moderate injury are the dashed red and the solid red are severe TBI. But we could discriminate them with high accuracy. Uh, and so the, and again, it's the, the cerebellar aspects of it. Here you can see what, we're, what we do with uh, the neuronavigator and the cerebellar hubs are shown at the bottom. The somatosensory cortex hubs are at the top. Those are Brobman areas whereas the bottom are what they call regions of interest, and including the red nucleus, the subthalamus, uh, and all the various parts of the cerebellum. And what's interesting is you can see that the long distance connections are blue, because they're particularly on, on the left. This person happened to be injured on the right. It's because there's minimal information flow in the long distance systems. Most of the information is in the red there on, in the, in the, between the hubs, the local hubs. As I was mentioning previously, an efficient brain does processing locally and minimizes the burden of long distance uh, transfer of information to the extent it can. There's always going to be long distance and, and, and local, but the ratio of the two is a measure of efficiency and correlates with intelligence. And all of this can be changed by biofeedback to some extent. There's limits, of course, but once you can see it, uh, and then reward or reinforce a greater efficiency, then uh, you can move people towards greater health. So thank you for watching.